The essential difference between <clears throat> military psychiatry and psychiatry in the community, which is caught up with a civilian disaster, is that uh, in principle at least, the military has a structure that can immediately be swung into action to assist in the assessment of the scale of the disaster and mobilise the appropriate resources. We believe that if we are in a position to mobilise the appropriate resources early on, we can prevent a significant development of this post-traumatic stress disorder. The reaction of the people to the disaster, victims and rescue workers alike, was truly wonderful. Here's one who worked tirelessly throughout the ordeal. We went straight on to rescue work and uh, we carried on all day and feel that we were instrumental, we and our staff, of saving at least 100 lives. It's all quite simple, we believe, and the important thing is to keep it simple. And we emphasise the need to prepare and the willingness to recognise that there will be uh, psychological casualties uh, following on a disaster and that for the most part they can be recognised and can be managed without the deployment of very significant resources. But the job satisfaction and the sense of the community responding appropriately is very hard to describe, but it is certainly very rewarding. These are the headlines at 7am today, Thursday the 17th of January. During the night, hundreds of American and British aircraft have mounted attacks on targets in Iraq and occupied Kuwait. The response of the community as a whole to the situation in the Gulf is something that is very evident. And I really feel it is important that we in the military share with the community as a whole and the staff in the NHS in particular how it is that we've gone about preparing for war, recognising that all of us believe that in preparing for war we fervently hope that war will never happen, but that once war actually does happen, our aim is to end it as quickly as possible with least cost to ourselves and indeed least cost to the enemy as well. But it is only by virtue of the community as a whole responding, and that response is seen by the people in the front line because that is very important for their morale and to understand that the people at home support them in their endeavours and are preparing themselves in their own way to facilitate their adjustment when the war is over. Townsend Torreson still insists that nobody knows what happened to her, but they also say that they see no reason to suspend services using the same sort of ship. It's likely that the broad cause of the accident is already known and acknowledged, and it'll be up to the public inquiry to paint in the fine detail of the last voyage of the Herald Free Enterprise. How do you actually feel today then? Mm, I feel much better today, you know, but I'm in a bit of pain, but I've never gone about it again. Never. It's really put me off going on the boat for life. It's not surprising. No, when I go home, I'm going by plane. <laughs> I think staff are very worried about media interest. They're very concerned about voyeurism. They're very concerned to maintain the confidentiality of patients and of themselves because they don't always want to talk about their own feelings. And the media are very interested in that, always, about how nurses felt and how patients feel and does anybody have any hatred towards what's happened. And I think nurses feel very strongly that they must protect patients, particularly from this type of voyeurism. In the midst of disaster, people need time and the last thing you need is voyeurism from the media or the general public. People need time to recover and staff need time to recover too. We certainly know that where there are significant numbers of physical casualties there will be a percentage of psychological casualties and the, that percentage figure varies depending upon which report you read how well it's been researched, how interested the people and the community are in actually publishing uh, those reports. If you're involved in a major incident, you are well aware that there's a very thin line between 
uh, appropriate concern and persecution, and indeed between research and voyeurism. For example, if I were doing the thing again, I would want to be quite sure that the people who were interviewed by prominent people in the presence of the press really gave an informed consent to such interviewing. One particular woman had a very badly cut face. She was photographed with a senior politician and told, did she mind one photo? She wasn't told that photo was going to be syndicated. So I think many of those patients felt very, very overexposed and wondered, if you like, about the interest that was being taken in them. I think the main advances in treatment has been one, not only our understanding of trauma, but actually in particular we're looking at trauma-based CBT. This does require the person to actually de de go through in detail the trauma, so being able to verbalise it, which for some people clearly is quite difficult. I think clinicians have been sort of criticised for re-traumatising people by getting them to talk about trauma in detail, specifically if you can imagine for some people talking about being raped and sexually abused is very difficult to talk about in detail. So therefore other types of treatments have come along which are very much based more on a physiological level that actually help people reprocess in particular the, the flashbacks which we know can be the most difficult part for people, something they find they have no control over and difficulty in shifting. These two main areas of it being with the EMDR which is eye movement desensitisation and reprocessing as well as actually rewind therapy. Rewind therapy is a new form of therapy which does not require the patient to actually have to go through in detail the traumatic event itself. It requires them only to visualise this tra uh, trauma, which they do anyway, and to imagine themselves on a TV screen and actually separating themselves from the trauma itself. EMDR, again, is another form of treatment that doesn't necessarily require the patient to go in detail in respect of their trauma. Um, the clinician sits with them and actually it's about actually trying to reprocess um, and detach themselves from a physiological level from the trauma itself. So what EMDR does is to ask you to remember, bring up the image and uh, start to think about it. But not to think about it with any great deliberation, any great cortical switching on and thinking what happened. It's a process of mindfulness which really means stepping back and observing from a distance and allowing the brain to do its own processing. In treating those people who've been caught up in a disaster, uh, the first thing of course to do is to try and rank order the people who are most at risk uh, and also to identify the resources that are available to, m to be mobilized. But the essential <coughs> philosophy is that the treatment begins as soon as possible as close as possible to the incident in question with the expectancy that the majority of people are actually going to cope. And it is important at even the earliest stage to feed that message into the people who are in a state of adjustment, who are in a state of shock, that they will cope. It was a cool September morning in 1989 when an IRA bomb ripped through the Royal Marine School of Music in Deal. The explosion was heard for miles around. As the dust settled, the horror of the attack became clear. Eleven Royal Marines bandsmen, most of them teenagers, lost their lives. Others were injured, some trapped under the vast weight of the rubble. Young Marines joined the rescue effort, searching for friends and colleagues. Pretty serious injuries, obviously, after the first two, but 16 of the young, young um, 16 year olds came in and they were really distressed. Obviously they'd seen sights that no youngster should see and they just needed, to be honest, a cuddle and a cup of tea and a cigarette. A practical example of helping people to cope following on a disaster was uh, our own particular experience of the, in the aftermath of the bombing at Deal, where uh, having arrived at the barracks, one of the first things we advised the commanding officer to do was to bring back all the young bandsmen who'd been sent home to their mothers, because we believed it very important that they should remain together as a group. And the interesting thing was that once they came back, 
almost all of them expressed relief at being back within the barracks because they were with people who understood what they'd been through because they'd been through it with them. And from there on, what we encouraged them to do was to talk about their experiences. And we encouraged them to do that at all times of the day and night. And it wasn't uncommon for us to find a group of bandsmen in the NAFI where they would normally be. And we, one or other of us in the team, would introduce ourselves and uh, begin the conversation by saying, look, uh, we weren't there, could somebody please tell us what happened? And quite interesting to discover how already at that stage people's memories differed and how important it was for them to establish a collective memory. We still have people now who, who are dying of their injuries. We had one last year. So the effects are still being felt both emotionally and physically by some people who were there on the day. Most people are helped by having the opportunity to talk about the events and to feel them, to know that if they don't want to talk about them at the time, they may want to do that later, and that that's all right. There can be reasons why the feelings are delayed. Very often groups of people who've been through a similar experience seem to be particularly helpful, and at least to be aware that the experience can reawaken earlier memories that need proper counselling or psychiatric or psychotherapeutic intervention. If you avoid uh, uh, confronting and reviewing fully the cause of the trauma, uh, then you will not give yourself an opportunity to update your way of looking at the world uh, in current circumstances, which is largely different to the time you were on the motorway crashing your car. We generally don't anticipate much use of drugs. The drug that probably we have used most commonly has been a short-term hypnotic, if only just to facilitate a return to sleep. And sleep disturbance is, is a very common feature, especially uh, sleep disturbances associated with unpleasant dreams, sometimes amounting to nightmares. We also draw attention to the need as, uh, for correction of the carbohydrate imbalance. When people have been exposed to a very frightening experience, they need their energy to be restored. And there is no doubt about it that the Salvation Army have hit upon the right answer. Produce a, a tea wagon with big pots of tea, heavily sugared, big thick wedges of sandwiches, and they're doing two things. They're uh, restoring energy to the people, but they're giving an opportunity to get together in a normal fashion. It's not the frank psychotherapeutic group that people fantasize about. Most people are used to going up to a tea bar, getting a mug of tea in a wedge, and standing in small groups around the tea bar. And that's the sort of uh, philosophy that we would advocate. Today, survivors and families who lost loved ones gathered to remember them. 25 years have passed, but for many, the anniversary is still painful. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. And so it's just, yeah, we thought we'd do the big one. Certainly speaking of the Clapham disaster, I know that psychotherapeutic, social work, pastoral colleagues are still seeing people. It does go on for much longer than one really imagines. Mm -hmm.